Yeah, so today Luis and I will be presenting um, this important benchmarking paper for um, integrating spatial and single cell transcriptomics methods um, for, I guess, both transcript prediction um, spatially and then cell type deconvolution. Um, and uh, yeah. um, so I just like to start as an overview for um, about what what exactly like we mean by integration and decomposition. Um, so basically we have two different um, approaches or two different assays, I guess you could call them. Uh, we have like single cell RNA-seq where you get like transcriptome wide measurement of individual cells. Then you have um, spatial transcript transcriptomic approaches. Uh, and we, we use Visium here, for example, um, which give you gene expression information that actually has spatial coordinates uh, but one of the limitations is that the the um, spot, it, the coordinates of the spots, um, well, the spots themselves are actually larger than cells. So naturally, we want to be able to actually um, do things like count individual cells in the spots and determine what cell type they are. But that's difficult um, without specific methods to do so because the spots are bigger than cells. Um, so there's, I guess that was sort of talking about the deconvolution side. Um, another thing is just um, mapping the single cell data spatially onto the um, onto these spots, for example, and that can be used to like impute missing or sparsely measured genes in the spatial data. Uh, so there's a bunch of new methods that have been developed to do both of those two things, integration and deconvolution. And it's a really new field that we're actively exploring. Um, so they had this figure that I think really nicely summarized like everything they basically did um, in terms of benchmarking these different methods. Um, so they have we have the two inputs like like I mentioned single cell RNA seq data and um, some sort of trans spatial transcriptomics data, uh, and then they have like a preprocessing. Um, pipeline, I guess, to make sure that all the data sets that are used are like treated the same way. Um, so I guess in the middle, we can see that they use like 45 pair data sets from the literature. And they also simulated data, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, and the two tests, like I sort of mentioned, were like what they call, I think they called it integration, um, predicting undetected transcript spatially, and then the cell type deconvolution tests as well. Um, and then they did a bunch of, uh, I guess, uh, they had nice graphics showing the different metrics that they used to measure the accuracy of um, both of those two tests, basically. Uh, and we'll go into like what metrics they used and stuff. Um, and then also another thing they did was they measured like, I think this was sort of like a smaller focus, but they measured like the computational resources used by the various different um, software tools, which was interesting. Uh, but I think the main focus was mostly like how accurate are these methods. Um, so I guess the section I'll be presenting on will be like the integration side of things. So um, again, that's like mapping single cell RNA-seq data to spatial coordinates, and then evaluating how well like the expression agrees with what we measure spatially, since we have it paired to spatial data. Um, and then one of the, I guess, this figure, um, figure two in their paper sort of showed that they did, um, there are two different like known marker genes that they use just to say like, okay, well, we know where these are supposed to be spatially. So um, let's check the expression that these tools predict. Um, and so, uh, I guess one result basically is that although this is only one of the data sets of like the 40, uh, I think it was like 45 they used, um, we see that Tangram seems to be doing pretty well. It's good for us since we're, <laughs> we've been really focusing on Tangram for the integration. Um, but uh, yeah, and then we'll go more into these, like they have four different plots for the four metrics that they used. Um, and um, yeah, I'll describe this more, but like in, 
I guess I'll focus on these bottom two courses like JS and RM SE. Well, I guess we know what RM SE is, <laughs> but JS is like another uh, Jensen Shannon divergence. It's another metric that should be like low, low is good in this case. Um, but uh, yeah, to describe like those metrics that they use, since um, it might be like over easy to overlook that in the paper. Um, they did describe them, but like they use a, little, a bunch of them. So um, I guess two of them that we're familiar with probably is like Pearson correlation coefficient. So this was just like the correlation between the predicted versus the actual spatial expression of um, different genes. Um, they also use like a sort of a custom metric based on Pearson correlation, um, which they call robustness score. So like that was like the proportion of transcripts that had a correlation above 0.5. So they used that in a few different figures. Um, I think we're pretty familiar with like root mean squared error, just measuring absolute difference between two different quantities. Um, some new ones that I, I haven't really, I've maybe seen, I think I've seen Chance and Shannon divergence before, but it's like maybe we're not, I don't think we really commonly use these. So it's kind of interesting to see. Um, like the structural sim similarity index, for example. Um, I know we kind of like, I kind of stuffed like formulas into this <laughs> uh, slide without having too many labels, but like basically, I guess, is that it's using, um, taking into account variant, variance, covariance, and the means. So just trying to make sure that two different distributions are pretty similar. Um, and then Jensen Shannon divergence is like a, a measure of um, how different two probability distributions are um, based on like KL divergence, which is, I think, kind of similar. But, uh, and then they also use like a custom metric that was sort of, since they use those four metrics, um, PCC, RMSE, SSIM, and JS, they wanted to like combine it into something to say like, okay, well, based on these four metrics, what's really the best <laughs> method here. So they sort of ranked how each method scored um, in each of those four metrics, and then took basically the average of each of the ranks for those, and then had some combined score that they called accuracy score for the AS. Um, and then um, this was sort of, these plots over here were sort of to show that like, I don't know, I actually was, not really sure why they put it in the extended figures because I feel like it was a, sort of a big result. Um, so this is where they actually, beforehand I sort of showed a figure where they did one data set in particular, but this was sort of um, looking at all the data sets combined to see how well predicted versus metric gene expression was. Um, and a theme in these box plots again is like Tangram is really doing well on uh, many different types of data. I, this is actually only part of the figure. They did more, uh, they divided it into other different classifications of what the data sets were, but I feel like these are sort of the relevant ones for us maybe. Um, and then uh, another detail is like to validate how these methods perform, they use like tenfold cross-validation. So that was like to split the set of genes. So most of these methods will take like a certain set of genes that you train a model on. And then um, with the genes that weren't trained on, you can evaluate the accuracy. So like this cross-validation method is a way to, to divvy up the genes into training versus evaluation groups. So that evaluate way, how good the method is on genes that haven't been seen. Uh, they also had like a note about um, sort of how sparsity in either data set, either this spatial or the single cell data affected the method performance. Um, and a cool thing they did is they, they actually picked spatial data that had um, below a certain sparsity level. So in, in other words, there was like a lot of um, rich gene expression in the data sets they picked. And they actually downsampled that data to sort of simulate sparse data. And that way they would actually have the paired graph, the original ground truth dense data. Um, and I, the findings weren't really very surprising. I think they were pretty, um, this is sort of expected. Basically they found that like the more sparse data was the worst methods performed. Um, 
on several different met metrics. And here, this RS in the figure figure three A over here, they go back to this RS that robustness score uh, proportion of genes, um, or yeah, proportion of genes that had a piercing correlation above 0.5. Um, but anyways, yeah, this isn't this is to be expected because like. Um, the more sparse the data is, the less information there is for the methods to pick up on and uh, map the in the data successfully. So it's like even a perfect method couldn't map um, sufficiently sparse data perfectly. Uh, but yeah, um, it's kind of cool that they tested this. Uh, yeah, I guess Luis will do the deconvolution part. Yeah, sure. Um... <laughs> Yeah, so again, like deconvolution for spatial data, it's um, you know similar but different from uh, deconvolution with bulk RNA seq data. Um, so, like the issue being that assays like 10x Visium, which like what we use at Liber, like the spots contain multiple cells. So what we want to do is predict which cell types make up the spot. So like there might be like two or three, uh, maybe more cells. You want to find out what's in there. Um, so basically their approach was to take some like gold standard data. They had two, one that's maybe more gold and maybe, a, so they had spatial data at one cell or less resolution. Um, they had two data sets like that, both are from the mouse brain. Um, and they had a method, um, there's like methods that for spatial, um, I think the examples that they pulled here were star map, seekfish plus, uh, I think they were both processed with SmartSeq. I don't totally understand the process, but basically they have spatial data at the one cell resolution. And that's what they're showing here in this graph. So they have that and they basically plot a grid over it and then treat each uh, individual grid um, as like a spot. Um, you can see that each grid like contains multiple cells, call that a spot and then use that as your, your spatial data. But we know what cells make that up. So that way it can be like our gold standard data. And then the other sort of gold standard, maybe more of a silver standard, is they had simulated data, um, simulated, uh, they had single cell RNA-seq data sets. And basically what they did is kind of like mini pseudo bulks where they put like a couple cells together into like, um, like a spot. Um, so they did that for 32 data sets. I think there are some different parameters. Um, yes, yeah, so that's the setup. Um, yeah, so. Then they moved forward and just like evaluated the accuracy using a lot of the same metrics that Nick just discussed, um, but uh, with this data instead. So they compared the true proportions, um, like up in this first, uh, I guess like up to the top right here, you see the proportion, you see the ground truth for the proportion of layer four excitatory neurons um, compared to the predicted proportions by these different deconvolution methods. Um, so on this data set, RCTD performed the best. Um, and then on the second data set that they have from like that gold standard, spatial DWLS performs best. And then all over the simulated data sets, um, like uh, cell two location performed the best over those data sets. So, um, and then they also noted that stride had also had good performance. So it seemed like those four were kind of the, um, like the, the favorites um, and had like the best performance um, in the in this uh, benchmark. Um, and I think that like a thought I had reading this was like the different methods performed differently on, you know, performed better on different data sets. And I think that's something we saw like in bulk uh, deconvolution uh, benchmarks as well. Like the Cobas et al benchmark had different methods performing better across different data sets. So I think that we kind of see that same, uh, that same pattern here. Um, but I think that they kind of point to those uh, cell to location, speed, spatial DWLS, RCTD and stride being the strongest ones. Um, you wanna go to the next slide? Yeah, so this was uh, kind of another version of that. So this time that second, that data set for that second, um, data set where they had real spatial information. Um, so here we see it's like uh, the visual cortex, I believe. So it's a bit of a different shape. Um, so you can see like the ground truth compared to like the different results. And I think here spatial DWLS matches that ground truth pattern the best. And we have like some 
uh, pretty low performers. I think like DSVI, you can see that it comes up with a pretty different pattern. Um, and we aren't seeing those layer five and six neurons uh, in the same spot. Um, yeah, and then at the bottom, you can just see kind of like their different, um, I guess like figure and D here, you can see the different, the uh, Pearson correlation, the SSIM and the RMSE and like GS. Yeah. So I think like something here is that like, you kind of do see like some, um, I don't know, it's like there's some overlap. Like uh, I think like here, I think spatial DBW, the LS is the strongest one, but it's not always, uh, it's pretty good, but there is some overlap with the other methods as well, so. Um, yeah, and then they had a figure expanding on their discussion of computational efficiency. Um, and just like, you know, it's important to like kind of keep in mind that like, sure it runs fast, but it's not very important if you're not getting good results. So um, kind of just focusing in on methods that we know perform well is like, uh, I guess like smarter. So I think across the top, they're talking about uh, integration. Um, so basically, the pattern that you see is as the data set becomes more challenging, either it has fewer cells overall, um, fewer spots or fewer genes to like input, you get worse results from pretty much every method, but some methods are more sensitive to that than others and or take longer to run then. So I think that you see that um, the like top performers are Surat and Tangram um, pretty consistently. I think that linger is also in there. Um, I don't know how that performed on the accuracy though, Nick. Do um, I don't think it was very good from what I remember. Um, yeah, I don't think it definitely wasn't in the top like four ever. Um, yeah, and then they had this like really big data set with two thousand or twenty thousand spots, a hundred or ten thousand cells, and fifty six cell types, which is quite a lot of cell types. Um, and like, I think that they point out here that like uh, cell two location actually fails this data set and they couldn't get it to um, complete the analysis. Um, and then they point out the memory and time usage across some other ones. So I just highlighted those top performers. And I think that um, uh, RCDC or RCTD had the, it was the fastest. You can kind of see that there's different kind of trade-offs between memory usage and time there. Um, and then at the bottom here, we see um, the deconvolution kind of uh, efficiency overview where I think like um, you can see like the number of spots, basically we expect time to decrease. I guess it's kind of the opposite here where things get a little easier. Number of spots decrease, number of, um, number of cells decrease, number of spots decrease, and the number of cell types also decreases. So they start out with a pretty challenging like 48 cell types is quite a lot. I know that like uh, we usually look at like 10 or 12, um, but we see that like cell two location um, is definitely one of the ones that takes longer along with spatial DWLS. RCTD is like more mid pack along with stride, I believe. These yellows are kind of hard to tell apart, but um, I think that like, um, it looks like our RCTD is like the competitionally like the most effective. Um, so cell two location, um, they also noted that it fails and it seems like sometimes can take a long time. So I guess like there's just like trade-offs to consider when choosing them, but it seems like between those couple methods, it's, uh, you know, uh, not too much of a trade-off. Um, but yeah, maybe RCTD would be a good candidate to explore. Um, I think that I've heard you guys talk about spatial DWLS and cell two location definitely, but I don't know. Yeah, we're definitely exploring cell okay. two location. Um, yeah, and cell to location required a huge amount of memory. And I think, like, we have the memory, but I guess they didn't. I think we used like 150 gigs, or I do. Yeah. In it. So that's probably what failed for them. Um, it requires quite a bit of memory. Yeah. I don't know if like our data sets are like reaching like kind of the extreme ones that they have here, but like, you know, they all, data always gets bigger. So that'd be good down the road. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but like overall, big, big picture, like Tangram was always performing or performing near the top or was the best method in, um, for integration. Uh, and then this, uh, I don't know how you say this, is it the Gym 6 or something? <laughs> uh, and Spa GE, those were also really like close contenders. They were pretty much performing very well each time as well. Uh, 
but this is good for us because we are like mainly exploring um, Tangram for integration. We are focusing more on the like the deconvolution side, but like uh, yeah, Tangram is doing pretty well. Yeah, and then for deconvolution, I think like RCTD, especially like they point out those four methods as like the strongest contenders. Um, but then like note that cell two location might be limited in its computational power. Um, one thing that I thought this kind of lacked is like they didn't really like explore accuracy over those different, um, I guess, like data qualities, like they explored computational efficiencies, but they didn't like know if any like methods could handle like more cell types or like, like better or anything like that, which like, um, I think would be pretty useful in like knowing how to like pick the best method for a specific data set. Um, so uh, they at least didn't like discuss that or have any plots like that in the main paper, but I thought that would have been kind of an interesting thing to note. It seemed like they had like a cool variety of data sets that like would have been cool to know. Um, but yeah, I thought it was a pretty, pretty good um, breakdown of these methods. Yeah, I think that's, that was it. Yeah. Cool.